Greetings, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be on a study on the life of Daniel. And he has a book, the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel tells you about the beast system and it ties into the book of Revelation but we're not going to get into that so much we're going to get into why the Lord said Daniel was greatly beloved why was Daniel greatly beloved of the Lord now that's an interesting question now the book of Daniel Daniel is a name, a proper name, and it's a two parts. Dan actually means judge. Dan was, there was a Dan who was one of the 12 tribes of Israel, one of Jacob Israel's sons. But the E-L part is a part of a name of the Lord God. So Daniel basically, or Daniel means God is my judge. That's what his name means. So let's take a look. Why was Daniel greatly beloved? Well, there's a, let's see. All right, we're going to, we could make this a many hour study. And honestly, I do not feel qualified to do a commentary on the book of Daniel. It is, I consider Daniel to be one of the three or four hardest, most difficult books in the Bible. I mean, I think Revelation is, uh, the book of Revelation is much more uh, understandable than the book of Daniel. There's a lot of stuff in Daniel I do not understand. Now we're going to go to Daniel chapter 4 and let's see, we're going to start in verse 27. Daniel is talking to Nebuchadnezzar who was the king of Babylon. A lot of people don't know it, but Nebuchadnezzar um, was given a great kingdom by the Lord and he actually wrote part of the book of Daniel under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So, all right, uh, Daniel chapter 4 verse 27. Daniel is speaking to Nebuchadnezzar. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee and break off thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of twelve months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built? Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Ooh, so he did it by his hand, he thinks. He's boasting. While Verse 31, while the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over, th over thee. Now what's a time? A year. So he's going to be like a, an ox 
eating grass for seven years. Can you imagine that? They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over, t over thee until thou know, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. You see, God rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whoever he will. You know why the Antichrist and the beast are going to come? Because God wills it. Because he allows it. Do you know why Hitler came to power? Because God willed it and allowed it to happen. You know why Joseph Stalin, who killed millions and millions and millions of Christians, happened? Because until thou know that the Most High rulest in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. You know why Obama was president? And why Trump's president? Because God gives it to whomsoever he will. That's why. And don't think that I'm uh, pro-Hitler or pro-Stalin or pro-Obama or pro-Trump. If usually I had a preacher that I really, really respect tell me that the, the leaders of the country, the rulers, the politicians, the kings, whatever, queens, whatever, are going to be a reflection of the spiritual state of the people that they rule. If you have a people that are wicked, you're going to have wicked rulers. And if you have righteous people, you're going to have righteous rulers. It's just, uh, it's not Bible, but this man that said that to me knew, I, I wish I knew 10% of the Bible that he did. So, all right. So, so he's going to be driven from men. He's going to be living with the, the beasts of the field. He's going to eat grass as oxen. Seven years are going to pass. And he's going to know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and give it to whomsoever he will. Verse 33. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. And he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagles', eagles feathers and his nails like bird's claws. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, listen to this, I, Nebuchadnezzar, he's, he's writing this. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and my mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever. Good, 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 good advice. Praise and honor him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion. Do you know what dominion means? It means you control everything. That's what dominion means. And his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And that's me. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? In other words, what do you think you're doing, God? Nobody can question him. I mean, you know, Satan could question him, but, you know, pff, what does he, you know, what does the Lord care? You know, you, you can't. You can question the Lord, but you can't stop what he's doing. Verse 36, At the same time my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. That means to bring down low. You don't want to have pride. That was 
Lucifer, Satan's mortal sin. All right, let's go to next chapter, uh, chapter 5, verse 1. Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Now, who was Belshazzar? Nebuchadnezzar's son. I guess Nebuchadnezzar was dead and, you know, fast forward, Belshazzar, his son, is uh, his, the king in his stead. Not instead, but in his stead, in his place. Verse 2, Belshazzar, whilst he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines might drink therein. Can you imagine that? They're taking the gold and silver vessels, the cups that were holy, dedicated to the Lord in the temple. And he's pouring wine in it and drinking out of them with his concubines, which is basically a, um, uh, it's not a wife, but he's, he plays around with her in the bedroom, if you catch my drift. That's what a concubine was. So here it is. He's desecrating the vessels of the Lord. I mean, that is, that's blasphemy. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised, praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. The gods of gold and silver, brass, iron, wood, and stone? You ever heard of a stone god? Idols. Verse 5. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Can you imagine that? Fingers of a man's hand writing upon the plaster of the wall. I mean, just the fingers. Just fingers. Not, not a man. Just the fingers of a man. Then the king's countenance was changed. Oh, yeah. And his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against another. He was so scared his knees were knocking together. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Why? Because it was probably written in Hebrew. I'm sure it was. Then the king Bel uh, Belshazzar greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed him, in him, and his lords were astonished. Now the queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet house, and the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. There is a man, there is a man in thy kingdom, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. Uh, right there, she's, she's half right. There's a holy God, but she's saying the holy gods plural with an S. You know, that's Satan's hiss, gods. And in the days of thy father, light and understanding of wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods was found in him, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say, thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. 
for as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams, and showing of hard sentences, and dissolving of doubts, were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar, whom the king named Belshazzar, this is that's Daniel's Babylonian name. And by the way, uh, the Tower of Babel or Babel uh, meant confusion. So what was Babylon? Take a guess. Now, da now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Then was Daniel brought in before the king. Now you got to realize Daniel's probably he's probably an old man now. Then was Daniel brought in before the king, and the king spake and said unto Daniel, Art thou that Daniel, which art of the children of the captivity of Judah, whom the, fa uh, whom the king my father brought out of Jewry? Hmm. I have even heard of thee, that the spirit of the gods is in thee, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. I don't understand how this guy could have been the king's son and not known who Daniel was. I mean, Daniel was like one of the, you know, Nebuchadnezzar's supreme counselors. I mean, he must have heard all the stories. I mean, come on. Uh, verse 15. And now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me that they should not read this writing and make known unto me the interpretation thereof but they could not show the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of thee, that thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts. Now, if thou canst read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about thy neck, and thou shalt be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let thy gifts be to thyself, and give thy rewards to another. Hmm, in other words, I don't want your gifts. Yet I will read the writing of, unto the king and make known to him the interpretation. O thou king, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom, and majesty, and glory, and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he slew. And whom he would, he kept alive. And whom he would, he set up. And whom he would, he put down. In other words, if he wanted to kill somebody, he did. If he wanted to keep them alive, he did. If he wanted to raise them up, uh, somebody is a prince, he would, and if he wanted to get rid of a prince, he did. Nebuchadnezzar was the ultimate new world order of his day. Verse 20. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointed over it whomsoever he will. And thou his son, O Belshazzar, Thou hast not, oh, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this. You see, he didn't humble his heart, and he knew everything that Daniel was talking about. Verse 23, But thou hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives, and thy concubines have drunk wine in them. And thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor, nor know. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, 
and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. Oh yeah, you're going to praise gods made out of silver and gold, brass, iron, wood, and stone, gods made with the hands, and you're not going to praise the God of heaven? He, Daniel's got a message for him. Verse 24. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the writing that was written. Meany, meany, feckle, up, uh, up, harshen. This is the interpretation of the thing. Meany, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Fickle, thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. So, in other words, God numbered the kingdom and it's finished. He was weighed in the balances and the scale was not balanced. It was lopsided against him. The kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Now, if you don't know who the Persians are, that's modern-day Iran. When the Persians took control of Babylon, they allowed the kingdom, the children of Judah, to return back to Jerusalem. They gave them gold, silver. They gave them money to rebuild the temple. Under You can read about this in the book of ne uh, Ezra and the book of Nehemiah. If memory serves me correctly, Ezra was the priest, and Nehemiah was the king. The Persians were very good to the children of Judah. Some people would say the Jews, but I prefer to say the, king, uh, the children of Judah because you've got a bunch of antichrists over in the Middle East that call themselves Jews, and I do not believe that those people are in any way, shape, or form related to the people I'm talking about here. So the Persians, the modern day Iranians, were blessed the children of Judah and allowed them to go back and rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. They were kind to them. And how are the people over in the Middle East that call themselves Israelis going to repay this generosity? Probably a war. I don't know when, but probably a war. Bomb them into oblivion. What can I tell you? Uh, it doesn't seem fair, does it? Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet, and put a chain of gold about his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain, and Darius, the Median, took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. Uh, the Medes and the Persians were... Uh, I don't know exactly how that works, but they were similar people. All right, let's go to Daniel chapter 6. All right, so Darius conquered Babylon. And uh, so let's read Daniel 6, verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom and 120 princes, whom should be over the whole kingdom. Now you're talking Babylon was basically, basically the world empire. It was huge. And plus Persia. I mean, you're talking a huge area. So... He had a 120 princes. That's 120 rulers. I mean, it was huge. I mean, you're talking basically the the whole Middle East and North Africa, and I mean, Babylon was huge. Um, Babylon was in what is modern day Iraq. So. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom and 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three presidents, 
of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred over I mean, I'm sorry, uh, was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. So he was going to make him his uh, operations manager, pretty much. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault in him, found in him. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Hmm. These sneaky little serpents are going to try to, you know, they, they couldn't find any treason within Daniel, so they're like, we got to find a way to trip him up. We're going to use... Uh, the laws of his God against him. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days Save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. So here it is. They're like, oh, uh, basically what they're saying is, if you, instead of praying to God, you got to go to Darius and make it any, you know, if you want to ask for anything. You got to go to Darius for 30 days. They're appealing to his pride. You know, basically they're saying, oh, for 30 days you're going to be basically God. So it's not just going to him to ask him for, you know, oh, king, can I, uh, can I travel out of the country or something like that? No, no, no. They're, they're basically, if you have a petition that you would to your God, not necessarily the God, God of heaven of Daniel, but, you know, any, any God. Babylon had more than several, a number of gods. Trust me. So they're saying, if you want to ask a petition of any God or man for 30 days, save O thee, O king, except for you, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Ah, remember this part of the story? Daniel in the lion's den? Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. In other words, when you sign a law, it couldn't be changed. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. So, verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows, being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. You ever heard of the Muslim call to prayer? Daniel knee, kneeled on his knees three times a day, prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. How many people do that? I know I don't do that. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Ah, oh, and, they, and they're going to tell him this. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within 30 days, save O thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. 
Then answered they and said before the king, Oh, that Daniel, that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh, maketh his petition three times a day. In other words, Daniel's breaking your law, O king. He's supposed to get thrown into the lion's den. Then the king when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. He's like, oh, oh boy, I screwed up. I let my pride get the better of me. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king established may be changed. Oh, yeah. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed <laughs> concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. He was so upset he wouldn't eat. Can you imagine that? This king cared so much about Daniel he wouldn't eat. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. He was so upset he wouldn't sleep, he wouldn't have music, and he wouldn't eat. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God, my God, hath sent his angels and hath shut the lions' mouths that they have not hurt me, forasmuch as before him innocency, as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then was the king exceeding glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no manner of hurt was found upon him because he believed in his God. Uh, I don't believe in karma, but <laughs> there's, here's payback. And the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children and their wives, and the lions had the mastery of them, and break all their bones in pieces, and ever they came at the bottom of the den. Then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell on the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. Sounds like Darius knows what he's talking about here, huh? He delivereth and rescueth, and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and earth, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So uh, you had Darius and then you had Cyrus. I think it was under Cyrus that uh, the 
children of Judah return to Jerusalem. All right, let's keep going. All right, let's go to Daniel. We're going to skip to Daniel chapter 9. This is going to be the explanation of why the Lord loved Daniel. Verse 1, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Now, the Chaldeans and the Babylonians were similar people. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. Now, Jeremiah is an interesting book. It's a hard book. It's one of the hardest books in the Bible, I think. Uh, Jeremiah was a prophet, not a very popular one, because he said, oh, Jerusalem and Judah, you know what? God, Lord's not happy with you people. He doesn't like your wickedness, your, your sin, your evil, and he's going to take the kingdom away from you, and he's going to give you into the hands of the Babylonians. King Nebuchadnezzar is going to carry you people away. Some of you are going to die. Others of you are going to uh, die of starvation. Others are going to catch disease. Others are going to be taken to Babylon as slaves. And that's what happened to Daniel. He was one of the ones that was taken. Uh, they were basically, they were slaves. I mean, that's it. He, Nebuchadnezzar came, conquered Judah and Jerusalem. And the thing is, all the priests and the false prophets and the kings, of the, uh, the princes in the court, they said, oh, pfft, don't listen to that, that Jeremiah. He's, he's one of those negative people. He, he doesn't give a positive confession. Don't listen to him. He's, uh, God, God loves us. We're his chosen people. He would never allow us to go into captivity and die of starvation and, and, and get conquered and have us killed. I mean, doesn't, doesn't he know that we're God's chosen people, the Jews? Uh, so nobody, hardly, nobody wanted to listen to Jeremiah. And you know what? I do not consider myself a prophet by any way, shape, or form. But I kind of understand how he must have felt you know, a very unpopular message, one of judgment for sin. And I don't care if you live in Australia, New Zealand, the United States, uh, the UK, the EU, or Canada. It's all the same. People are, are evil. I mean, there, there's like almost very, very, very few true Bible teachers um, I mean, there's so very few. I, I, yeah, it's just, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible. And, uh, God promised, uh, or prophesied that there'd be a falling away and we're here. I mean, it, it's, it's bad. But Jeremiah, the prophet, said that they'd be in uh, captivity for 70 years. God's spanking Judah. I tell you what, 70 years, all the people that were in Babylon, I mean, uh, in Jerusalem that were taken captive into Babylon, 70 years later, there's probably almost nobody left that were of, you know, uh, age, you know, a decent age. You know, if you were, 15 years old, when you were taken into captivity, you're 85 now. You know, 15 years plus 70, you'd be 85 years old. There's not going to be many, hardly any people alive who were, remember the old kingdom of Judah 70 years later. I mean, that's, that's like two generations, people. So... All right, so verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof, in the, uh, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years 
in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Do you know what sackcloth is? Uh, you know, like bags of rice come in. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not comfortable clothing by any means. He's not wearing clothing, soft, comfortable clothing of the king. And he's putting ashes on his head. I mean, you know, we're not talking about uh, luxurious face cream like the ladies like to use. No, he's you're talking prayer and supplications, fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant... Yeah, God made a covenant with Abraham. Actually, God made a covenant with uh, Noah. And then God made a covenant with Abraham and his son Isaac and with his son Jacob and with his 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. Keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Wow. You see, God kept the covenant. And people will say, well, you know, God's got an eternal covenant with the Jews. Well, the true children of Judah, yeah, God's got a covenant with them. But guess what? God kept his end of the bargain. The children of Judah did not. And neither did the children of Israel. They didn't keep the covenant. They broke the covenant. All right, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. See, the house of Israel and the house of Judah is not the same. And it's a new covenant. Not what these Hebrew roots deceivers tell you. Oh, it's going to be a renewed covenant. You're going to have to keep the law. No. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant, not a renewed, a new one. Guess what? When you get a car, a new car, you got a new car. It's not renewing the old car. Okay? Just You get a 20-year-old car and you put a new transmission in it. Guess what? The engine's still shot because it's 20 years old. And the body's rusted out. And the shocks are shot. And the, 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 the tires are bald. Okay? It's... You know, I'm sorry, but I'm not Jay Leno that could, you know, spend a million dollars restoring a, a 1913, uh, whatever, you know, old car. Uh, now, it's a new covenant, not a renewed covenant. You're not keeping Torah, okay? The new covenant is with Christ. Christ kept the law because we couldn't. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. See, God kept his end of the bargain. They didn't. Which my covenant they break. Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. See, God's going to put the law on your heart. 
He doesn't need it on a tablet of stone, keeping Torah. No. The law is going to be written in your heart. And if it's not written in your heart, you're not his people. All right, let's go back to Daniel. 9 verse 4. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Listen carefully, verse 5. This is why the Lord loved Daniel. We have sinned. Oh yeah, we have sinned. Not, oh, they sinned. Uh-uh. We have sinned. In the book of Romans, verse 3 and verse 23, It says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that's you, that's me. But that doesn't include Christ. Because if Christ sinned, well, then you need another Savior. When it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, believe me, that's everybody except Jesus. Here's a wonderful verse, 1 John chapter 1, verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All right, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse, uh, starting in verse 20. For what glory is it if, when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if, when ye do well and suffer for it, Ye take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. Will somebody give a memo to the charismatics? Because they don't believe not one word of this. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Huh? Leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. He was crucified on a cross, a horrible death, and, and uh, as an example, who did no sin? See, Christ had no sin. Who did no sin? Neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. When the Pharisees were accusing him before Pilate to have him killed, he didn't threaten them. He didn't say, oh boy, you guys, when I come back, it's going to be payback, dude. No, he didn't do that. Nope. So Christ knew no sin. Back to Daniel chapter 9, verse 5. Daniel. Eh, Verse 4, And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant, mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned, we have sinned, and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened that means we didn't listen. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets. That's right. They didn't listen to Isaiah. They didn't listen to Jeremiah. They didn't listen to them. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. 
O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces, as at this day, to the men of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to un, unto all Israel that are near and that are far off. You see, Israel was taken before Judah was taken into captivity by the Babylonians. Israel and part of Judah were taken captive by the Assyrians. So that's what he means. Um, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and unto all Israel that are near and that are far off through all the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass that they have trespassed against thee. You see, not everybody was in Babylon. They were scattered all over the place. You know what it means to trespass? It means you're someplace you're not supposed to be. Through all the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass, that they have trespassed against thee. All right, let's, uh, let's read verse 7 again. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces, as at this day to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to and unto all Israel that are near and that are far off through all the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, unto, I'm sorry, O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face to our kings to our princes and to our fathers because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness though we have rebelled against him. Boy, I tell you what, if the Lord wasn't a God of mercy, I'd have been dead when I was 16 or 17 years old. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. You know, a lot of people don't understand this, but there are basically three sets of laws that the Lord gave. And uh, it's not the Noahide laws. That's a bunch, that only exists in the minds of the of uh, the Antichrist Jews. There were the laws, the law, the, the Ten Commandments that were given by Moses, and then you got the two commandments given by Jesus, which basically sums up the ten. And the the two commandments that Jesus gave, well, let's read them. All right, uh, those of you that listened to me for a while, you, you've heard this many a time, but I'm going to say it again. Matthew chapter 22 and verse 35. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying. So now this is not a, uh, a, when you're talking about a lawyer, you're talking about a guy that's a specialist in Bible law, not this garbage that runs around today, you know, like an attorney, a lawyer that we have today that deal with man's laws. No, this guy, this guy was an expert in the laws of the Lord, which if you want to read the laws of the Lord, look up Leviticus and uh, Deuteronomy. Knew all those laws. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, when it says it's tempting him, it means he's trying to trick him. He's trying to, you know, he's trying to trip him up. And he goes, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. 
Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You see, you don't have to keep 600 plus laws. No. If you love the Lord with, all, with everything, and you love your neighbor, and, you know, if you're living next door to a bunch of satanic cannibals, I suggest you move. Find somebody decent to live next to, you know. Uh, but that's just my opinion, you know. Maybe the Lord wants us to love satanic cannibals, but I don't think so. Okay? So, basically, the Ten Commandments that were written on tab tablets of stone given to Moses, Jesus sums up into the two. And remember earlier we said that God would give us a new covenant uh, and he would write the law in our hearts. Well, this is the law he's going to write in our heart. Love the Lord, love thy neighbor. I mean, how can you go wrong? But the three laws are this. You had the moral laws, the ten or the two commandments, which apply to everybody. Then you had the Levitical law. The Levites were the priests. They were the ones that served in the temple. They were the ones that took animals and did blood sacrifice. Okay? Christ fulfilled those laws, and only those laws were nailed to the cross. Then you have the laws of the king, the kings, the civil government. So you had the moral laws, which were for everybody. You had the Levitical laws, which were for the Levites, the priests. They served God in the temple. And then you had the civil laws for the king. Those were the laws like uh, not taking, uh, the king could not take a lamb and sacrifice it and take the blood and put it on the altar. It was, no. God would have, God would have killed King David if he tried to do that. That was for the tribe of Levi. Period. That was their job. But King David, his job was to enforce the other laws. Like when you caught somebody, a murderer, and the Bible said that in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall everything be established. If you caught a murderer and you had three or four witnesses, the murderer was to be put to death. That Florida school shooter thing, if that was not a fake thing, if that was for real, and we've got so much fake news, I don't know what's real or what's not real anymore. Uh, and, if, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, go to YouTube and type in uh, Robbie... R-O-B-B-I-E, Parker, P-A-R-K-E-R, -E Sandy Hook actor. And then find a video that's like two or three minutes long. You'll see this guy coming out, and he's smiling and he's laughing. And then uh, he gets, he's, then he goes over to the camera and he starts uh, hyperventilating. And then he starts play acting that, oh, I lost my daughter, oh, boo-hoo, boo-hoo. You know, here, here's a guy that lost his daughter and he's laughing and smiling uh, 30 seconds before. Crisis actor, CNN. I remember watching this guy when Sandy Hook happened. That's why I'm uh, extremely disturbed at the media. Of course, hey, there's six major corporations that own the entire media in the United States. And I'm sure the rest of the world's not much different. So... But the thing was, is if there was, uh, you know, if they caught people doing sodomy, the king's job was to execute them. Murderers, the king's job was to execute them, not stick them into a private prison and have the state pay the private prison corporation for the rest of this person's life and feed him steaks and pay for him to have cable color cable TV, and air conditioning. I think it was Florida state law that they had to give them steak twice a, a week. You know, when I was working two jobs, going to college, uh, I didn't eat steak twice a year. I mean, you know, I, I, what can I tell you? But that was the king's job. He was to enforce the civil laws. 
And people don't understand that. And then they'll, these false preachers will tell you, well, all the laws were nailed to the cross. And, and they'll tell you, oh, well, yeah, you can commit murder now. Just believe in Jesus and you're, that's it, you're saved. I don't think so. Is killing is killing people loving thy neighbor? No. No. But what can I tell you? But that's the difference between the three sets of laws. Only the Levitical laws, the laws of blood sacrifice, those were nailed to the cross. The other laws, I don't believe, were nailed to the cross. But the thing is, Israel and Judah broke the covenant. They wouldn't keep God's laws. So God's like, oh, you don't want to keep my, my laws? No problem. You can have Hitler. You can have Stalin. You can have Chairman Mao of China, the greatest mass murderer that ever lived, from what I, my research. You can have the New World Order. You can have the Beast. You can have the Antichrist, the Man of Sin, the Son of Perdition. You can have that. You don't want my, my government? No problem. I'm going to give you a wicked governor. I'm going to give you a wicked government. You people are wicked. I'm going to give you what you want and see how you like it. Yeah. Remember, God raises up kings. God puts down kings. God raised Pharaoh up. God put him down. God raised up Nebuchadnezzar. God put him down. God raised up Belshazzar, his son, and he put him down and gave his kingdom to the Medes and the Persians. You know why Donald Trump's president? Because God wants him to be president. I'm not saying Trump's good or bad or the ugly or, you know, it's just, it is. Personally, I don't have much faith in Donald Trump. But, uh, of course, uh, I always tell people, I, I think people voted for Trump not because they were voting for Trump, but because they were voting against Hillary. What can I tell you? All right. Back to Daniel 9, verse 11. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse, the curse is poured upon us. Did you know that there was blessings for obeying God's laws? And there were curses for disobeying. Guess what? The EU, the UK, Canada, the United S USSA, the United States, and uh, Australia, New Zealand, is cursed. God's curse is upon our wicked nations. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. And he hath confirmed his words which he spake against us and against our judges that judged us by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done upon Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us, yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. When you get a preacher that says, just believe in Jesus, but you don't have to turn from your wicked ways, you don't have to repent of evil, you're listening to the wrong preacher. Therefore hath the, hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth, for we obeyed not his voice. And now, O Lord our God, that has brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and has gotten thee renown, as at this day, we have sinned. We have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because of our sins. And for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now therefore, O 
Our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. O oh my God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thy, thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name, for we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake. O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. Hmm. And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, for the holy mountain of my God, Yea, whiles I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, and Gabriel's an angel, he's not just a man, but just remember, God made man in his image. Yea, whiles I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Now, who is a Gabriel? So, who is this Gabriel? Well, let's go to Luke, book of Luke, chapter 1, starting in verse 5. I'm already gone over an hour, so let's keep going. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, of the course of Abii, Abii and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, now, Aaron was a Levite. He was the brother of Moses. So these guys, boy, they got a, quite a lineage. <clears throat> Excuse me. I mean, Aaron was, you know, Moses' brother. He was the original first priest. So, And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren and they both were now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole, you see, the, the king, like King David, couldn't go into the temple as for, you know, to perform these kind of deals. I, you know, God would have killed King David. If King David would have performed a, a blood sacrifice, God would have killed him. Not your, it's not your job. You're a different, you know, the king, the king was to, 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 to fight the Canaanites and the Philistines. Remember the Philistines, the giants, Goliath? That was David's job. That was his job not the stuff with the priest's office. All right, so, verse 8, uh, verse 9, okay. According to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord, and the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. <clears throat> and there appeared unto him an angel, an angel of the Lord standing on the right side at the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. I tell you what, you see an angel, you're going to, yeah, you're going to be troubled too. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife, Elizabeth, shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Now, a lot of people will disagree, but I tell you what, the New Testament was written in Greek. You know why? Because a lot of Israelites were taken to Greece. You want proof? Book of Joel, chapter 3, verse 4. Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon, and all the coasts of Palestine? Will ye render me a recompense? And if ye recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? In other words, 
you're going to give me something, I'm going to give it back to you on your head. I'm going to pay you back. Listen carefully. Verse 5, Because ye have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things. The children also of Judah, the children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians that ye might remove them far from their border. They took the children of Judah and the children of Jerusalem and sold them to the Greeks, the Grecians. Guess what? There was the children of Judah and Jerusalem. They were sold into slavery to the Grecians, to the Greeks. And guess what? Guess where Paul went? To the Greeks. Ephesians, Ephesus. Colossians, Colossae. Corinthians, Corinth. Those were cities in Greece. The New Testament was written in Greek. Why? Because the children of Judah were in Greece. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians that ye might remove them far from their border. Behold, I will raise them out of the place whither ye have sold them and will return your recompense upon your own head. Isn't that wonderful? Okay. Uh, verse 13. Uh, John, I'm sorry, Luke 1, verse 13. We're going to go back. I know, I skip around a lot. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And when they tell you a fetus is not a child, well, John is going to be filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. And many, not all, and many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, Elijah, that's your Greek rendering of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. In other words, how in the world is this going to happen? I'm old and she's old. It's impossible. You know, I'm an old guy and so's the wife. We can't have children. Are you nuts? That's basically, the, that's the Bob modern translation. Now there's a difference between asking how something's going to be and saying, oh, that's impossible. You know, it has to do with the tone of voice and the way you present it. Verse 19, And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not able to speak, until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not, my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. Oh, yeah. When the Lord sends an angel to give you some, tell you something, don't question and say, oh, that's impossible. It can't. No. 
And when he came out, he could not speak unto them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. You know, what kind of greeting is this? You know. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Yeshua HaMashiach. No! And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. You know what? When you're trying to cast a devil out of somebody, you don't cast him out in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. No. And shalt call his name Jesus. Devils tremble at the name of Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Praise the Lord of that. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? See, she's not saying, Oh, that's impossible. I haven't had I haven't been with a man. That's impossible. No, she's not saying that. She's asking, How's this going to be, being I know not a man? See, there's a difference between the way what she's asking. She's asking, how, how's this going to happen? Because I'm a virgin. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a, Jude a city of Judah, and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me, for lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the, bee, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which are told her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaid, for behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath holpen his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. 
and Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. Now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered, and she brought forth a son. And her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. And it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child. See, they were supposed to circumcise the ch uh, children on the eighth day. And that was the law. And they called him Zacharias after the name of his father. And his mother answered and said, Not so, but he shall be called John. And they said unto her, There is none of thy kindred that is called by this name. And they made signs to his father how he would have him called. And he asked, and he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, saying, His name is John. And they marveled all. And his mouth was opened immediately, and his tongue loosed, and he spake and praised God. And fear came on all that dwelt round about them. And all these sayings were noised abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. Let me tell you something. There's people that kept an eye on John the Baptist. And all they that heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. Do you know what it means to redeem? He redeemed his people. If you take something valuable, let's say a ring, and you go to a pawn shop and you get a loan against the ring, guess what? You got to pay back the pawn shop if you want your ring back. That's called redeeming. See, we were all sold into bondage of sin. We couldn't pay the price to be redeemed from the law of sin and death. And yet Christ, who knew no sin, was the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. He alone, only God, could redeem us from the law of sin and death. And that, people, is the gospel. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath revisited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved, saved from our enemies, and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, that he would Grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. Holiness and righteousness, you don't hear that preached very often. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy, the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. Who's Gabriel? Now you know. Back to Daniel 9 and verse 21. So here is Daniel's praying and fasting and praying and sackcloth and ashes. and Verse 21, Daniel 9. Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, I mean, Gabriel's no mere man, he's the angel that stands before the Lord, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation, and he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am come now forth to give thee skill and understanding. Okay? 
At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. For thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. See, Gabriel came to show Daniel and to tell him that he was greatly beloved. Why? Because Daniel acknowledged his sin. He acknowledged that God was great with blessings and praise, which is something we should all do. I'm guilty as all of them. So, we may as well read the rest. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the, be uh, the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself and the people of the prince that shall, uh, that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And that was Rome. And the end... Thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now, a lot of people will tell you that this is the Antichrist. I don't think it is. But that's just my opinion. And I'm not a know-it-all. Uh, of course, when I was 17 years old, I thought I was a know-it-all. Hey, pfft. You want to know any answer? I, I knew everything. Just ask me. I'd have told you. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. See, Christ caused the sacrifices to cease. The Roman army in 70 AD surrounded Jerusalem and burned, destroyed the temple and burned it to the ground. It's pretty, you know, the, the stones weren't burned, but I mean, you know, they were all thrown down. Read Matthew 24. Jesus said that there wouldn't be one stone left upon another in Matthew 24. The wailing wall is not part of the temple. Either it is, and Jesus is a liar, or the Wailing Wall is not. And quite frankly, I believe Jesus over the Jews. Gabriel says, I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. God loved Daniel because he was faithful. And he had acknowledged the sin of his sin and the sin of the people. Well, people, that's why the Lord loved Daniel. Uh, there's a lot of prophecy in the book of Daniel, and it ties into the book of Revelation, and it ties into Matthew 24. Uh, it's just... You know, I've got a general idea, but I do not feel worthy or qualified to teach uh, the prophecies of Daniel. It's just, it's a hard book, in my opinion. It's, it's a hard book. Even Daniel was told to, to seal it up until the end times. Um, Daniel didn't understand what was going on, and uh, he was told to seal the book until the end. You know, when the end times do happen, and people have been talking about the end times for almost 2,000 years, uh, but when it happens, people are, God's going to pour his spirit upon all flesh uh, that are his anyways, and we're going to understand. 
In the book of Joel, which is considered what they call the minor prophets, uh, because of their size is minor, um, not because of their importance, uh, as opposed to the major prophets, which are long. But in Joel chapter 2, verse 26, And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise, praise the name of the Lord your God, that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And that's me. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days, in those days will I pour out my spirit. So in the latter days, God's going to pour out his spirit. So, all right, well, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. And that's Jesus, who is the Christ, in his precious name. Amen.